I am a studio brat. I'm from Hollywood. And uh, I grew up essentially on sets, my little sister and myself. And this was during the Depression years when the industry had long since changed to sound and the big, big pictures in Hollywood were coming out. My mother was a secretary at Universal Studios. A secretary today would be called administrative assistant or queen of the world or whatever, but she was called secretary. And the secretaries on a major studio lot at that time knew everything because they read the morning call sheets for all of the films that were being filmed. They knew where everybody was. So when my mother's boss, a man named Milton Feld, who was vice president in charge of production, and he had his own unit, uh, when he'd say to my mother, find out where so-and-so is, who is the art director, uh, she would respond immediately. He's on stage 28, and he'll be there for another half hour. Because, she, you know, they all knew everything. Uh, and she was really tremendously efficient. And she used, of course, a studio Underwood, studio-issued Underwood. And that was, became very, very important to me in my choice many years later, many years later, to try writing. And my mother earned extra money by taking that studio Underwood and getting somebody to help her put it in the rumble seat of, our, of her little Ford and driving off the lot with it. And the guard at the gate knew she was doing that and one or two other secretaries were doing it. And she'd come home and honk the horn and I'd run out and help her carry the Studio Underwood into the apartment where she would work most of the night typing scripts for extra money. In those days, the Studio Underwood, which became very much a part of my life, um, she had to put in six pages, seven pages plus six carbon sheets and fold them in and get them in properly and then type a script. So what she did was go as fast as she could and she'd make a mistake. She would have to t remove, turn the platen, get to the point where the mistake was and erase the letter or the two letters on each of the pages, the white pages that were there, get them back, arrange it so it fit perfectly, and then type in the, the proper word, the proper spelling. So it was a struggle. And I saw her do this and looked over her shoulder and I knew what she was doing. I knew she was typing the words that the actors would say. So at the Saturday matinee, when I went down the street to the Fox Carmel Theater every Saturday afternoon, I told my friends, I said, you know something? Those guys up on the screen, they don't make that up. They actually have a, a, a script and they memorize the lines. For weeks I was hated. They didn't want to hear that. They just wanted nothing to do with that. They wanted to know that the illusion was real. And so anyway, I was one, the first in my little group that knew that, <laughs> that words were written by people. And it got into my blood. I did not decide as a kid, I think I'll be a writer. That didn't come for many, many, many years. But it informed my life. I kind of grew up making an assumption. And the assumption was that somehow I would be involved in something that happens on a studio lot. I didn't know what, I didn't think it through. I was interested in everything. I, I was interested in the editing process, I was interested in, in, in art design, the sound man on the set. Anything that happened, I was intrigued by it. My mother had, my mother's boss had a, a production unit and Universal produced some of the lowest budget horror movies ever made uh, and they developed the whole concept of, of sequels, the Frankenstein meets the Wolfman and things of that type. They also did some very good pictures, Destry Rides Again with James Stewart and Marlena Dietrich. And um, they discovered a young girl named Edna Mae Durbin. They changed her name to Deanna Durbin. And Deanna Durbin was 13 years old. And they put her in a picture called Three Smart Girls. 
and the other girls were Nan Gray and Barbara Reed. And my memory of that picture is that the three girls were running all the time. They were running from here to there, and Deanna would stop and sing, and she had a lovely, sweet soprano voice. And the writers of those films uh, simply structured that kind of story. The result was when, when this picture was released, Three Smart Girls, it made a ton of money all over the country and was a picture that actually saved Universal Studios, which was on the edge of bankruptcy. I mention that because my mother in the Depression continually lived a fear of job loss and economic disaster. So it was the Depression, and there was only my mother and two kids. And it was a very tense thing. All of the personnel on the lot were, were concerned about that because Universal and uh, across town RKO were always on the verge of bankruptcy. So that was a, that was a major concern. But again, from a, a, your life, my life, kind of informed what I wanted to write about later, later on when I decided to write. Uh, family struggles and mother-son conflict, mother-daughter conflict and sibling rivalry and where's dad situations and putting those relationships into larger ideas and larger themes including westerns because many years later I found myself working on a couple of westerns. One of them was called Rawhide and it was about a cattle drive from Texas up to Railhead in Denver. Well, what do I know about that? You know, I know, I know nothing about it, but I knew about relationships because I had lived them. And so when Rawhide, when, excuse me, a wonderful, wonderful picture, Red River, which was screenplay by Borden Chase and Charles Schnee, and it was based on, uh, on Chase's Saturday Evening Post story. And uh, Howard Hawks directed it, not John Ford. It was a marvelous story of a cattle drive, but the story really was a father-son relationship. It was John Wayne was the guardian of Montgomery Clift, and that struggle was the basis of the picture, and everything happened on that cattle drive, but the heart of it was that struggle. So that's what I felt I could do. I could get into whatever the human relations were, and it really motivated me later. I never had any idea of being a writer, um, a writer of comedy or drama. Uh, it just didn't occur to me. And when at the time came, and uh, Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 41, and later I enlisted. I didn't wait to be drafted. And I conned my mother into signing the papers. I was stationed in England, um, 381st Heavy Bombardment Group, 555th Squadron, 8th Air Force. And the job was to fly over the continent with specific bomb bombing targets. I was a bombardier in a flying fortress, a B-17. We had a 10-person crew. And there were uh, up in the nose, I was up first in the nose, a navigator sitting behind me, a pilot and co-pilot, and an engineer, all, all of us up front. And then moving back, we had two waist gunners, and we had a, a, a belly turret guy and a tail gunner. And it was a full crew, and it was ideally named B-17 Flying Fortress, because it, it was. And so the staggering of the, of the planes in formation was such that we kind of fit into each other. So it was, it was good, except that with a heavy bomb load, um, we were rather slow moving. So we were targets. Once we hit what we called the turning point, wherever we went, let's say we went into Germany, and a turning point was the city of Magdeburg, which is in the middle of Germany, and we could turn at that point to hit Berlin or turn the other way and hit some of the southern cities. Berlin, of course, was the big target. I went to Berlin six times. I flew 35 missions. And um, I kept going. I mean, the original tour was 20, then it was 25, then it was raised to 35. And I, so I kept going. And 
the fact of the matter is if you were if your plane was knocked out of the sky you had a moment if you could get out because you had a chute that was partially hooked onto you and you had a moment to hook the rest of it and go get out and you could be caught in a slipstream it was it was dangerous and you'd get out pull the chute and hope that's all you could do and when you got down there and if you were captured right away you were instructed under the terms of the Geneva Conventions which the United States had signed name rank serial number that's the information you were required to give you gave nothing else and of course you had your dog tags on so they could they could tell who you were and so it was that sort of thing. Now, of course, a lot of guys didn't make it. They were caught on the way down. Uh, they were machine gunned as soon as they hit the earth and so on. So I, it, I didn't have to jump uh, at, at any time. But the B-17 was an airworthy plane. Props, of course, this was long before jets. And we had two engines on each side. I was in the nose right up front and there was no buffering in the planes at all. So it was the aluminum struts. You were just sitting there, which means that the sound of the engines was overwhelming. And I think I possibly lost some hearing at that time. And William Wyler, the celebrated director, Major Wyler, actually became deaf. And it, so it was, a, it was a difficult thing, but there was an enormous amount of teamwork. The bombardier was supposedly in charge of the crew, that is to say, giving comment to the crew on what the target was, because they weren't in the briefing room, what we were doing, where we were going, and where the biggest uh, saturation of flak was, and so on. That combat crew was a family of people. It was people who relied on each other. And as, you, as I look back, I see that there was some kind of older brother, younger brother, younger siblings, and so on. And we were very, very close that way. We were all completely different from each other. The Southern guys had certain similarities in terms of their behavior and their language and everything else. But generally, we were a family of people. And you learn how to work with each other or you really mess up. So we did learn that, and that was, again, that was a part of, I mean, if you're, <laughs> years pass and you're writing a family comedy, you don't think about World War II, but it's in you. You can feel it. You understand relationships, and that was, that was extremely important. And I, I know I called on that all the time and recalling, particularly in ex extended family stories where they're brothers, they're cousins, and those relationships, how they had certain jealousies that you had to control, and how all of that happened. And it was, uh, it, it became part of me. So that was, that was a formative time that meant a great, great deal. I got back and I got some decorations, I think mostly for survival, but essentially I got the air medal with uh, six oak leaf clusters and the, the unit got a presidential unit citation and, and um, we did well. It was about how you were able to work with people. Ironically, recently, here we are in 2008, recently I had a talk with somebody uh, in the in the 2007-2008 strike and who was um, having some problems picketing and so on. And that particular writer, whom I'd known for years, always had a trouble with working with a team on television shows and everything else. He couldn't do it. And I, I remember talking to him and I'm saying, this is a business about working with other people movies, television, whatever it is. And that's what we all have to learn. I learned that in World War II. I learned how to work with people. The writer's job is the most important. This is a town of storytelling. And what, whatever the story is, is, is the most important element. 
But after that, you have to work with people. You have to work with producers, directors, art directors, everybody, if you're still associated with. In television, you're always working with people. And even though you don't like the instructions you get, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You have to be able to give and take. And it's essential. And I learned it fast. Obviously, you learn it within your own family, or you're the black sheep. Uh, and I learned it really in, in flying these missions. It was very, very important to me. After the war, and after the, the post-war is an amazing experience in itself, because trying to get back into civilian life. A lot of guys did it successfully. I had a struggle. I was still upset about a lot of things that happened during, during the war, and I wasn't comfortable in getting back. But I did get into the University of California at Berkeley on the first GI Bill. A whole generation of young men were able to go to college on the GI Bill that ordinarily would not have gone to college. So it was an extraordinary development for a full generation. So I went back, I was in Cal, and trying to get acclimated and going to classes and so on. And I was uncomfortable with it, I didn't like it, and yet I knew guys coming back who really responded well. So it had some kind of turmoil going on in, in me, it had to do with that. I spent a lot of time in the library, and I began to, I worked in the library a bit, sorting out books and so on. And I did a lot of reading, and I began to write down a lot of the experiences that I had. And I wrote in prose, I wasn't thinking of plays or anything. And then one day, a new industry developed, television. And I saw the Rose Bowl game of January 1948. It was uh, USC and Michigan. And I couldn't believe what I was watching. I'm here, and I'm there, a, t a television set is 20 feet away, and I'm watching a football game. And I'm watching everything that happens, even with greater clarity than if I was in the stadium. I thought, this is, this is fantastic. So I was interested in this crazy new medium and then, of course, everything went on the air. Terrible stuff went on the air. Test patterns went on the air. I still wasn't thinking about writing. And then, as a whole new generation began to get into this new medium, uh, I began to think about it. And I, what I really, really wanted to do was simply get into it in some way. And I knew the way was, the way had something to do with telling stories. I didn't know what. I still wasn't thinking, I know what I'll do, I'll be a writer. And I got a job reading stories and writing synopsis of those stories and writing a brief comment. And that kind of got me involved and I wanted, I began to think I want to do this, I want to tell stories. Now I had no feeling because at that time Patty Chayefsky, Horton Foote, Robert Allen Arthur, George Roy Hill, a lot of superb talent was coming up in television, mostly in New York, and they were writing interesting things, Reggie Rose, a lot of people. And it was, it, it was something that I looked at and admired enormously because I knew they had a few bucks to make a movie or make a, make a live show, and I was fascinated by it. And I kind of flashed back to my time on sets in Hollywood. And what I can remember, because I want to just break away from television just for a moment, and, and I want to get back to what I picked up on sets in Hollywood. At the beginning of one summer, my mother phoned the studio manager of RKO, a man named Sid Rogel. And called him up and, and in the way of those days, people that had worked before in very low budget films got to know each other and did favors for each other and so on. And apparently Mr. Rogel owed my mother one. So she called Sid Rogel and said, Sid, I want you to put my kid to work. Uh, this was a, in the middle of the depression. It was approaching the summer. And so 
I went to work at RKO, which is, you, you know, now, now it's part of Paramount. It's the, the, the entrance was on Gower, just above Melrose. And um, so I went to work there in the mailroom. I was a messenger boy. There were about nine or ten of us. And we were assigned go to stage nine and take the script to the director or go up to the costume department and get this for that stage over there and so on. So I knew people according to the names on the door. I mean, that was, that was about it. And I had a bike, a studio bike, and rode all over the place. And in the course of this, I, if I'd get a, a mess, my turn came up and we had a dispatcher. Okay, go to stage nine take this script to so-and-so on stage nine. Okay, that was my assignment. I go to stage nine and go on the set, and there would be this amazing set, which was designed by a great guy, Edward Stevenson, and decorated by a man named Van Ness Polglaze, and they were a team at RKO. And it was a nightclub setting and it was for Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Nightclub, ballroom floor, dozens of tables, and in walked, as I walked on stage, in walked dozens of background people, dress extras, people who had at home formal dress and so on. And they came in and sat down at the tables that they were assigned and got ready to do the wallop, you know, the talk, 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 talk that nobody could hear, but they were talking. There was an orchestra in the background, a 12, 13, 14-piece orchestra, and a young man named Manny Harmon was the conductor, and they were getting the playback ready. And the, uh, the director was um, the famous George Stevens, father of George Jr. Now. And Stevens, who directed everything, he directed Gunga Din, he directed every conceivable thing, and he was a master of the of camera. And so they were getting ready. And while I was standing there waiting to give a script to somebody, um, the background people came in, sat down, and suddenly the lights started coming on. And the playback started. And suddenly you were in a nightclub a glorious, beautiful nightclub. I'd never been in a nightclub, but I was on a set, and I knew it was a set. But suddenly, I'm standing there, a kid, with a script in my hand, and I kind of lost everything except I was in a nightclub. The illusion became life for me. The illusion became real. And here come Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, and they're chatting and kind of going over their marks with Fred's assistant, Hermes Pan. And I'm looking at this, and I'm totally involved. I forgot about giving a script to somebody. And I, of course, I knew, hey, it's a set, and there are lights, and these are extras, and so on. But I got into it. I got involved, and I wanted the illusion more than I wanted anything out in the street, anything real. And I finally snapped out of it and gave the script and I had to, had to get back. But that happened to me a lot. And it just seemed to get into my bones that that, that illusion was what I really wanted. Well, of course, I knew as I was growing up that movie attendance was based on people who wanted those illusions. And so every studio made, not a Stair Rogers, nobody could do that except a Stair and Rogers, but they made pictures strangely about well-to-do people in the middle of the Depression. They called them white telephone movie, uh, white telephone pictures. And most Americans, of course, had a simple black telephone, but they, the white telephones were the rich folks who lived in penthouses. And we went to those pictures because that was glorious. It was glorious escape. Once in a while, you know, you would have a depression set movie, but even that was the illusion. So it, it was, it was a, an extraordinary experience, and I was kind of 
informed by that. Every, everybody was in a sense, but being on that set gave me that feeling of the illusion. And later, years later, when I was writing things, I kind of wanted to recreate some of that. I got a job reading scripts for the original, the original four-star productions, which was uh, preceded by a few years their later filming. But they were forming four-star productions, and it was uh, Charles Boyer, David Niven, um, Dick Powell, and Ida Lupino. And they were going to alternate making little stories, but they were going to be filmed in Hollywood. And so I was hired to be one of the people who read. And uh, so I read, read some things, and um, I wrote a, uh, oh, I wrote a glowing comment on a story by Paul Gallico that appeared in the Saturday Evening Post. And it was about a Cuban boy who stowed away on a liner. This was in the Batista, Cuba. Stowed away on a liner and somehow managed to get on the liner, get a job, get to New York, and so on. It was a rite of passage story. So I wrote a little comment. I said, of course, this is nothing for any of our stars, but it is something that the company might be interested in making. And so David Niven walked into my office, uh, office, I had a desk, and he walked in and he said, um, why do you think it's not for any of us? And I said, well, the star is a little boy. And David Niven said, well, you know, you can make it a relationship between an older man and the kid, and the older man can help the kid, you know. I said, oh, right, okay, thank you. And that was, that was it. Well, Niven told the head of Four Star, you know, give that kid over there some more to read and so on. So anyway, I did, without knowing it, I began to be Excess, successful. An agent came to me later and said, um, there's an opening in live television. Um, can I put your name in for it? And I said, yeah, but I can't afford an agent. Just, you know, tell me about it. So um, I called up and I went over and I had an appointment with an eccentric man named Albert McCleary. And Albert was a producer of live television drama. And Albert hired me right away. So I had to leave the, this little film show and go over to um, Albert McCleary. And I went back to New York and um, started to work on his shows, the original Half Hour Hallmark with Sarah Churchill introducing and I, reading material. That's what I was doing. I wasn't writing anything. I was reading. And they wouldn't let me near a writer. I was too in a formative period of time. NBC built the Burbank Studios, which are still there. And CBS built the Beverly and Fairfax Studios, which are still there. This was in 50 and 51. And I, I was assigned out here to NBC. I was hired by NBC to work as one of several story editors on a show called NBC Matinee Theater. The reason the show existed was that NBC wanted to sell color television sets because RCA Victor was an owner of uh, NBC, was the, a participant in, in, in the ownership. So. Anyway, I started working for Al McCleary and uh, reading everything and doing everything, and I began to be uh, a story editor. Now, they had story editors in New York who were excellent, who were buying material that had already been done and revising it and so on. And I was here, and I began to realize that I was good at talking to writers and getting writers to express themselves. And I began to see what their fears were. And I began to be helpful. And I didn't write 
for NBC Matinee Theater. I didn't write any originals. But I began to feel very strong in working with other writers. So I felt good about that. That was my introduction into what I think I do best, which is whatever the title. I've had producer titles, associate producer titles, and so on. But the best thing that I've ever done was called story editor. Once it was called executive story consultant, whatever that is. And a producer, I produced some shows and so on. But story editing really got me going. And I thought my contribution there was major. I still do. I still think that I'm really good at working with writers, spotting their problems, and helping them develop them. I wanted to now talk for a moment about a strange show, Twilight Zone, which I worked on because I had worked in live television with the writer Rod Serling. I was story editor of Playhouse 90, and Rod wrote six originals for Playhouse 90, including Requiem for a Heavyweight. So he started Twilight Zone, and I was still under contract to CBS, and he asked me to join them, and I joined in uh, the second season, and I was given the title associate producer. We had a wonderful producer, Buck Houghton. And again, talking about relationships and things that, that I learned through the course of my life, um, Twilight Zone set stories 500 years hence, 100 years hence, 1,000 years hence. It set stories in the past. It set stories everywhere. But the successful stories were all relationship stories. And Rod Serling was very, very skilled. He was a unique guy who influenced all of us. And what, he did, what Rod did, what he brought to it, was a real, a, a, a mixed feeling of a, a look into the future and the social problems of the future, but he had a yearning for the past. That was Rod. And he loved the small town that he was from, which was on the Finger Lakes in New York. And we did a lot of stories of the Twilight Zone took place in the past of a certain character. Small town past, gazebos, bandstands, drugstores. The things that were most um, moving to Rod in thinking about the past, and yet he was a very sophisticated man of today. And so, again, in talking about, talking over stories with Charlie Beaumont and Richard Matheson, George Clayton Johnson particularly, and, and others who wrote for the show, um, it, all of that always came forward. What are the relationships? And the stories that had those relationships were, for me, the most successful in the Twilight Zone series. So, again, Everything that informed my life uh, began to inform stories. So I was really, in, in every show that I worked on, uh, that, came, that came to the fore. It was a very, very productive time. And what, whatever, whatever it was, I, I once worked on a show called The Lieutenant which I think came and went fast. And the show was uh, at MGM, and it was about a young lieutenant in training at Camp Pendleton, a Marine. And it was his relationships with people. And Robert Vaughn co-starred as the captain and his boss. And again, family relationships. We did some very good scripts. The show was not a popular show. It was on the air at 7.30 at night when the networks opened opposite the return to television of Jackie Gleason. <laughs> of course, everybody watched Jackie Gleason. But uh, anyway, what I was able to contribute once again came from relationships, always. That was, that was really the essence of it. And those stories that, t that took place in the, in the Twilight Zone, in all the shows that I worked on, including Peyton Place, uh, including Bracken's World, which was a series of stories about the movies, and the favorite experience, my favorite experience in all of this, in all the years, 
was working on a show starring Anthony Quinn. Anthony Quinn, a great, big, flamboyant movie star of the past who had made many pictures in Europe and was an associate of Fellini's. And Anthony Quinn returned to the United States to play the mayor of Albuquerque, a, a, Hispani a Hispanic mayor of Albuquerque, produced by Universal Studios. So he came back not knowing anything about American television. And he stopped off in New York and went into John Lindsay, the mayor's office, and chatted with him and said, what does a mayor do? And then he went across the country and he went to uh, New Mexico where this was to be shot, Albuquerque. He talked to the governor of the state, the mayor of Albuquerque. He, got, he bought property in the state to show his commitment to the people of New Mexico. And we're going to shoot it here in New Mexico. And we have a lot of Hispanic people as extras and so on. He got to Universal and Universal Studios told him, no, it's going to be too expensive to move everybody down there. We'll shoot it here. And Tony Quinn looked around the Universal back lot and said, it's not the same. But he went with it. And so we shot it essentially at Universal Studios and back lot and so on. And a few locations, not many. The, I bring it up because I learned from Anthony Quinn. Even though I'd been in the business for many, many years, I learned from him because Anthony Quinn would say to me, as I had an appointment with him at 7 a.m. in his trailer dressing room, he never asked for anything. He didn't ask for a larger trailer dressing, nothing except what about this scene or what about that scene? He was all actor. And I really absorbed everything from him. He was tough, tough as nails to work with because he just would, would not do a scene that didn't make sense or didn't work for him. So one of my jobs was to meet him and get the changes in the morning, work the changes out, agree, you know, I'd have to agree, then I'd have to rush call the, uh, the producer and say, this is what Tony wants. And the producer would say, oh, that, we shouldn't do that. I said, I would say, I'm, I'm awfully sorry. I had to move. I had to do something. So I was careful, of course, but I essentially went with Tony Quinn. He said to me, and again, this meant so much to me, he said to me, he was very angry at me one morning, and he said, Dell, listen to me. He said, why in a scene, why can't I just breathe a little? Why can't my character just say to somebody, where'd you get that tie? Is that on sale somewhere? And I'd say, but that's not about the story. He'd say, yeah, that's right. It's about life. And he really, was, he was all actor, marvelous, marvelous experience. I got a call in the wee hours of the morning from the producer who said to me, I have the flu, I feel terrible, and I could hear it in his voice, and go down to Tony Quinn as soon as you can get to the lot and tell him that I just got a call from NBC and the show, The Man in the City, starring Anthony Quinn, has been canceled. So I went down, it was probably bef long before seven, and Tony was just arriving at his trailer dressing room, and I went in, and uh, it, this, was, this was killing me. I knew it was a problem. So I said, Tony, could I just have a minute with you? So he dismissed the, the uh, makeup man, and he said, what is it? He said, I've got some notes here. I said, Tony, um, I'm just going to you know, be straightforward with this. I just got a call from the producer the show has been canceled. And Tony stood there. He's a big man. He's about six foot two, and he was in very good physical condition. And I could see the blood rushing up through his neck to his head. And I could see him start to tremble with anger. And I stood there, and I thought, he is going to hit me, and he's going to hit me hard going to hit me. He's much taller than I am. He hit, may hit me right on top of the head. He may hit me right in the face, but I can't turn now. 
and I stood there while he shook. And finally, after about 45 seconds, maybe 60 seconds, I could see the blood begin to recede from his head and his neck, and he stopped trembling, and he turned to me, and his first words were, let's go steal some stationery. One of the shows that I, that I worked on was the original, The Untouchables. The Untouchables was, uh, the series was based on a book um, by Oscar Fraley after a series of interviews with uh, an FBI man in Chicago in the early 30s named Elliot Ness. Um, Desilu Studios, which was a combination of the old RKO and one or two other studios, and was a very major factor in the production of films, uh, essentially for television. And Desilu made a two-hour film based on The Untouchables by Oscar Fraley. And it got, I think it got an Emmy or two, and did very, very well. The part of Elliot Ness was played by Robert Stack. Stack was not the first choice. Um, Van Johnson was the first choice, but Van Johnson did not want to get into television schedules, which were every actor knew were very rough. Um, seven days to shoot one hour and so on. So they got Stack. Right away it was obvious when he made this two-hour film that he was the right Elliot Ness. And he was straightforward, grim, um, he played the part. He played the part. He was, he was very good in it. They managed to sell it as a series. And the series began with uh, stories that were developed out of the reality of Chicago gang wars in the early 30s. Essentially, this was it, in late 20s and early 30s. Essentially, this was the mob which was created, really, in a sense, by prohibition. They were bringing in booze from all over, and they controlled the bringing in of contraband liquor. The prohibition was not ended until 33, until uh, FDR came in. And so in the series was actually set up to 1933. So those stories were about the mob, the, the mafia, bringing in illegal booze, defending it, and mob fighting mob. And essentially the Capone gang, the original gang, was headquartered in Chicago, and there were outlets in New York and other major cities. But essentially that was the setting. And a lot of the stories came out of the reality of what happened in those days. There was the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Uh, there was the, um, the various assassinations, various hits. And that was real because we had all the history. And, but essentially, this was fictional work done based on those years in the early 30s. One of the mob people was Frank Nitti. Frank Nitti was a, a Capone lieutenant. And Nitti was, was a killer, was a real killer. And in one of the early episodes, Frank Nitti was killed. He was killed in a gunfight with the FBI, with Ness and his, his group. And that episode was so successful that the network and the studio decided he is so, that character was so involving and so popular, played by the actor Bruce Gordon, bring him back. And everybody said, you can't bring him back, he's dead. We, we showed that, that he was dead, and they said, bring him back. So he was brought back as if nothing had happened, and it worked. And that character went all the way through the history of The Untouchables. But essentially, there was a certain dramatic form to it. What the formula, and it was that, was that somebody unknown to the mob was making moves on the outside somewhere 
to take up a part of their authority, another gangster that they'd never heard of. And that particular gangster was making serious moves in, into the mob's authority. Elliot Ness and the Untouchables, there were four of them, they were untouchables because they were among the very few cops, law authorities, who could not be bought off. That was why they were called untouchables. So the untouchables heard about a mobster who was making moves on the edge of Chicago and decided one thing to do was to either play them off against each other which was dangerous, the public would be caught in between, or they would attempt to find that guy, whoever that guy was, and confront him and try to deal with him. That was their job too, it wasn't just the Capone gang. And that became a little too formulaic, we did that so much, but it was very effective. And we began to get stylized, and there were some marvelous, marvelous people on it, and, and cinematography, production design, everything was skillful. Guest stars were marvelous. What, before Walter Matthau began to do comedy, he was wonderful as a gangster. Um, we had everybody playing guest star roles in it. It was a tremendously successful series, and it went on and on and on. And it, again, for me, working there, as story editor, working with writers. Now those were the days before staffs of writers joined television shows. Usually freelance writers came in, pitched ideas, they were hired or they were not hired. So if you did 30, 32, 34 episodes in a year, which is what people did in those days, you needed a lot of script material. So we interviewed a lot of people, a lot of writers. And we had some wonderful people on staff. George Eckstein was a casting man before he became a writer. And while he was there, he wrote a couple of terrific scripts for the show. And we had, what, what we had with The Untouchables was something that, that I know I've mentioned before, but I want to hit it again. It was a teamwork show. That was the idea. Alan Armour was the executive producer when I was there, and he was absolutely outstanding as an executive producer and the guy running the shop. And so we had marvelous people, and we had directors, Paul Wenkos, Stuart Rosenberg, who went back to New York and directed 19 episodes of The Defenders. Um, we had marvelous directors and Walter Grauman, Bob Butler, people that were very, very skillful. And it, it was just a tremendously creative experience. In the process of this, and I want to mention this, uh, Bob Stack frequently was not happy. He didn't like this script, he didn't like that script, and so on. He was usually right. But it was very difficult in a weekly, weekly schedule to keep changing things. So he was not the happiest with me. Years later, after the show, when I would run into him at screenings or something, he was very, very friendly. And the antagonisms of the past, and that happened a lot on any show, that you would run into people later who were away from that particular pressure, and Stack became very friendly, and I really enjoyed talking to him after that. The Untouchables was a great creative experience for me, and it had to do with the, what I could do in the whole concept of teamwork. That's what I could do well. And so we used, well, John Mantley wrote a number of scripts. John did it very, very well. Um, we had uh, many, many people who came in and did an episode and did them well and they had to go back for many rewrites. And this was, so we developed, we developed relationships with these people. Again, my strength, and I became convinced of it, was working with writers and spotting their problems, their weaknesses, and their strengths. 
and I knew I could guide them effectively. And I thought I did well with that. And of course, I knew what Bob Stack needed, what he wanted, and I knew what a guest star needed. We had a marvelous episode with Ed Asner, and we, we just used, we were able to use everybody because the guest star roles were always good. So it was, it was a, a great, great experience, and it informed my life. It helped me, and I helped that show. It was just a, a, a marvelous personal experience. Through the years, I've worked on many, many television shows in various capacities, um, called producer, associate producer, executive story consultant, and so on, but always working with writers, story editing. And one of the most interesting was Peyton Place. Peyton Place was based on a novel by Grace Metallius, a bestseller, which Fox had made into a film. And the film was successful, and they wanted to make a series of it, and they tried and tried and tried and tried. John Mantley wrote a pilot, didn't sell. Paul Monash wrote a, wrote a pilot, it sold. It went on to ABC. And it was a show that was important, I think, in the, in the history of American television because we used a staff of writers. Everything that I had done before that time on various series was freelance writers, individual writers coming in and pitching stories. With Peyton Place, right away, we used a staff of writers. Now, all comedy shows always used a staff. There was always a, 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 a writing room for comedy writers, but very rare uh, in, in dramatic stories, and I think probably the only, the first time in prime time network television that that had been done. And we had a, a marvelous group of people. Dick DeRoy, who just died a week ago, here we are in 2008. And Dick was extremely skilled, and then a very young lady, Carol Sobieski, who, who did some wonderful work, Peggy Shaw, uh, Lee Siegel, Lionel Siegel. Uh, we had I'm, forget, I'm going to forget names, Rita Lakin, um, Sonia Roberts. We had, we had a very good group of people, essentially selected by Paul Monash, who had written the pilot and was now executive producer of the show. And so when I joined the show, I joined the show on episode 33. I stayed with it until episode 513, which was the end. I wrote the last episode. Otherwise, my job was not to write, but to story edit. And I sat down with usually the producer, usually with uh, Nina Lemley, who was another story editor on the show, and we plotted out the continuing story of Peyton Place, which was a continuing story. That in itself was, I found, intriguing. And th then we divided it up and gave certain episode assignments to the staff of writers who had offices right there on the lot. Very unusual way of, of, of doing things. And it began to work. And I think to all credit to the originals who, were, who, who started the series in October, went on in October of 64, and that included Dick DeRoy, a few others. As I say, I joined in episode 33 and went all the way through. All the way through. Young actors played interesting parts on it. Ryan O'Neill, Mia Farrow, Barbara Parkins, and Chris Connolly, particularly. And we had all guest stars came in constantly and constantly. And it was a very effective job of telling a continuing story. It was considered primetime soap. It was not that soapy. It was pretty straightforward storytelling melodrama. And it really was enormously successful right away. The Mia Farrow playing a 16-year-old girl, and Mia was only about 19 or 20 at the time, and the entire world of high school girls imitated her hairstyle. She had blonde hair down to her rear end. 
and she was, it, it was tremendously successful. Mia was unhappy on the show because she was playing a part that was not close to her at all. And uh, so there were, pro there were problems, the usual, usual problems in the, f the first year. And we went on. We were, we were on twice a week. And at one time, the show was so successful for ABC, we went on three times a week. Uh, that, was, that was too much, a bridge too far. And then we went back to twice a week. By that time, the young actors, Ryan O'Neill, Barbara Parkins, Mia had left the show. Ryan, Barbara Parkins, a young man named James Douglas, had matured in their parts. And they became very skillful. They were really very, very good at it. And it was interesting because we began to write less for the characters but, and more for them. It was a process by which we kind of fed what they were doing. They were skillful, so we fed that. And it was very successful. Now the show, unfortunately, we went through the summer at a time when a new show called Laugh-In went on the air. Laugh-In was one of the big hits of television history. It was a variety show, comedy, very funny, very popular. We were opposite that. At that time, we decided excuse me, Paul Monash, Bill Self, and others decided at Vox, it would be okay to introduce an African-American family into the mix of the families on Peyton Place. So we began to plot it. Now here we are, a bunch of white liberals who think we know all about black life. We knew nothing, absolutely nothing. So fortunately, we were able to cast some wonderful people in the role of this family, Ber Percy Rodriguez who was actually, we use the term African-American now, he was really African-Canadian. But anyway, Percy was a wonderful actor, a very handsome man, and he played the father. Ruby Dee, a great actress, and wife, of course, of Ozzie Davis, and uh, a young man named Glenn Turman played the son. Glenn is now, in 2008, playing uh, older folks but he was the young man in it, and it won wonderful actors. And we got them in, and they began their rehearsal, and this bunch of white liberals were telling them how to behave and so on, and Ruby Dee and Percy and Glenn came forward and said, we don't do that, we don't do that. So they instructed us, which was good. At one point, Ozzy, Ruby's husband, came out to talk to us, and started setting us straight on certain things. We, Fox hired a, a young uh, African-American man. We, call, we called him black at that time. It's the way they wished to be called. And uh, Douglas Glasgow, who was a, uh, a clinical psychologist, he came in to talk to us about, about these parts and so on. So we got some pretty good advice, and we hired some young black writers. And that seemed to be, uh, you know, the way to do things. So it was a, we began to grow and began to understand things. By that time, unfortunately, TV Guide and other publications picked up the fact, hey, we're introducing a black family. Then we began to get some negative mail. What are you bringing black people into the mix for, you know? So there was a certain resistance on the part of the, the audience. Anyway, we did it well. We did it very skillfully with the advice of the, of the actors, Ozzie Davis and Ruby and so on. And we very carefully brought them into it. We brought Percy, the father, into the, into the mix very early on. And Percy was seen as a, fr as a friend, a colleague, a doctor colleague of a doctor played by Ed Nelson. And so it was very casual, very simple. And that worked, and then one day we went back to the, to the home and began to do stories about the home. And again, a bunch of white liberals doing this. It, it was, I look back on this with, with a, astonishment that we had the, the chutzpah <laughs> to even, even attempt this, but we did. 